Welcome to today's talk. My name is Amy Smith. I'm the Bariatric Program Manager here at Northeast Georgia Medical Center. So welcome this afternoon. We have several treatment options, of course, here in our program with medical nutrition, uh, with our dietitians. Uh, we have medical weight loss with our obesity medicine specialist, intragastric balloon, which is a non-surgical procedure. And then, of course, we have metabolic and bariatric surgery. Uh, so several treatment options. Uh, we'll hear a little bit at the very end about the support that our patients all receive as well. And what I tell people is even if this isn't something that you struggle with, everybody has friends, family members, coworkers, um, and neighbors that could benefit from the services that we have. So I want to um, introduce our speaker today. Today we are actually joined by Anna Powell. She is one of our obesity medicine specialists. She's a diplomat of the American Board of Obesity Medicine and Family Medicine. And today she's gonna be talking to us about when to consider bariatric surgery, thoughts from an obesity medicine specialist. So I'm gonna turn the talk over to her. If we have time at the end, then we will be able to address some questions. If we run out of time, we will have an email address where you can certainly send uh, emails and we can get those questions answered for you. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and turn the talk over to Dr. Powell. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Anna Powell, and um, we're going to be talking today about when to consider bariatric surgery um, and all that that entails. So an overview, what we're going to talk about today, um, we're going to define obesity. Um, we're going to discuss its comorbidities and how they affect patients um, over their lifespan and their quality of life. Um, we'll discuss um, our spectrum of obesity treatment strategies and when surgery should be considered our title. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the most common surgical options that are offered, um, how they differ in terms of their um, structure, their uh, metabolism, uh, some about their uh, outcomes, and overall risk. Uh, that'll lead us into um, some review on data of safety, and I'll end with uh, resources for patients if you would like to know more. So obesity defined, um, obesity is not simply just being overweight or having a high BMI. Um, the Obesity Medical Association actually defines obesity as a chronic, progressive, relapsing, multifactorial neurobehavioral disease, wherein the increased body fat promotes adipose tissue dysfunction, and that abnormal fat mass forces result in adverse metabolic biomechanical and psychosocial health consequences. That's a lot. So you can tell how this progressive disease affects our entire body, not just how we look, but actually how we function and how that affects our every aspect of our lives. Um, obesity prevalence, it's a pretty big problem. In the US, 40% of adults over the age of 20 have obesity, and almost 20% of our youth from ages 2 to 19 have obesity as well. Um, it's not uh, equally um, spread among all aspects of our society. Uh, Hispanics and Blacks have a higher prevalence compared to whites, and um, while Asians have the lowest, um, it's important to note, and we'll talk more about the classifications in a minute, that um, obesity in Asians is defined as a BMI of over 27. This trend is projected to um, increase over the next 10 years to be almost 50% of our adult population. And so there's just more evidence of why this is so important for us to talk about um, and learn about and to uh, be proactive in the treatment of obesity. So how do we classify obesity? Um, well, we start with a BMI of over 30. Um, class one is from 30 to 30, 
35, class 2, 35 to 40, and over 40 is a class 3 obesity, and this will be important um, later in the talk as we um, discuss the indications for treatment um, options. How else does obesity impact um, us? Well, the healthcare costs of obesity are enormous, um, depending on where you're reading it. Um, impacts our uh, expenditure from anywhere from around 150 billion to 200 billion dollars a year. Um, and it's significant that patients with obesity are twice as likely to be prescribed um, medications for um, various conditions compared to their healthy weight counterparts. And that incurs costs to the patient, and that's very significant, and around $1,500 more a year on average um, than patients with healthy weights. Um, so what are some of these conditions that we're talking about? They're named comorbidities, and there are really over 200 of them. Um, here are just a few of them um, linked to their respective uh, body systems. Um, we all know about the cardiometabolic uh, diseases like diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. Um, we don't always think about it, but reflux is uh, associated with uh, the comorbidity of obesity. Cancer and pretty much all forms of cancer uh, are an increased incidence with patients with obesity. Our reproductive system, um, think about things like PCOS and fertility. Um, our liver can um, develop fatty liver disease, uh, which can lead to cirrhosis, which is uh, actually the number one cause of um, liver cirrhosis now in um, this country is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or fatty liver um, in patients such as these. Um, with our lungs, we think about obstructive sleep apnea, need for CPAP um, at night, hypoventilation, which means that the patient can't um, breathe effectively because of fat mass, um, and leading to things like uh, exacerbation or, uh, or development of asthma. So our obesity treatment strategies, we employ a comprehensive team-based care um, because no one area is going to take care of a disease this complex. Uh, we start out with self-directed lifestyle changes that encompasses things like diet, exercise, uh, talking to the patient, making suggestions of things that they could um, change about their, their lifestyle, just being more um, physically active. If that doesn't get us the results, then we add on professionally directed lifestyle change. Um, this is when we start involving some of that comprehensive team. Uh, you can consult your registered dietitian, um, get the patient on a specific individualized eating plan. Um, possibly we're adding meal replacement programs at this uh, stage. We're getting exercise therapy involved sometimes writing an actual prescription to the patient for a, an amount of physical activity goal for them for the week. Um, if that's not in effective enough, then we can start reaching out for pharmacotherapy. And this is where the uh, physician often comes in, um, either with your primary care physician maybe, or you've consulted us in obesity medicine and we uh, work with the patient um, and try pharmacotherapy or medications to help at this stage, most medications that we have to offer the patient are um, fairly effective. Around 5 to 10% of their total body weight loss can be projected to be lost um, with, with medications. But sometimes medications are just not, not enough, even with the addition of um, our uh, lifestyle changes that we've talked about. And that's when we start thinking about weight loss surgery as an option. Um, to compare numbers, uh, the weight loss surgery um, types can get you anywhere from 30 to 50% uh, of your uh, excess body weight loss up to a uh, bypass, which can be more like 60 to 75% of your estimated body weight, um, your excess, excuse me, body weight loss. And then sometimes since 
obesity is a chronic relapsing disease, your uh, patients may have, uh, they may have remission of their obesity, they may have recurrence. And so sometimes our uh, treatments spectrum includes post-surgical combinations of any and all of these three can be anywhere from needing revision of, of surgery or or progression if it was a stage surgery to adding medicine medications back to augment uh, weight loss that has slowed or regained that has occurred um, and then as always continue those lifestyle changes that we've initiated at the beginning of treatment so that brings you to uh, our um, neck of the woods, which is uh, the role of obesity medicine specialists in the care of these bariatric surgery patients. Um, our first goal um, when we are considering this is to identify a high volume, low complication rate uh, bariatric center, which for us is uh, very fortunate that we have a bariatric center of excellence here at NGHS. Um, so that part is, is kind of easy for us. We uh, need to be conversant about surgical options and contraindications um, with patients and talk about the risks um, because nothing is risk-free and especially when we are talking about a procedure um, where anatomy is being changed. Um, we need to talk about that spectrum of treatment with the patient and involve them in uh, nutrition, physical activity, um, psychological support, we have support groups, um, maybe even prescription medication um, during this time period. Um, and um, keep in mind the patient's surgical history. Sometimes these patients are seeking surgery. Sometimes these patients have relocated and have had surgery, but have had weight regain. Um, and most important, it's important for us all to remember that surgery is a treatment, not a cure. Um, there is no cure for obesity. Um, the post-op patient may still need um, additional treatment um, even after they've had surgery. So how did weight loss surgery originate? Well, um, before we had drugs like Prilosec and Nexium, the PPIs, um, peptic ulcer disease used to be treated um, pretty much with surgery and they had to surgically remove um, part of the stomach. These ulcer patients were found um, to or observed to lose weight after their partial gastrectomies. And in the 1950s, that gave birth to something called the jejunal ileal bypass, which was found to be incredibly effective in weight loss. Unfortunately, those patients um, had significant, uh, significant um, problems from the uh, malabsorption from such a drastic change. And in the late 60s, Dr. Uh, Edward Mason um, developed the Ruin Y gastric bypass procedure, which is um, the grandfather, if you will, of the procedure that is used today. Um, first, it was um, performed open, and then now is laparoscopic, and even in centers such as our own, it's a robotic surgery, um, which has a lot of good news for recovery for patients. So talking about why surgical treatment is so effective, let's talk about what is done. The uh, main two that we'll focus on are the vertical sleeve gastrectomy and the gastric bypass. The vertical sleeve gastrectomy anatomically is, is fairly easy uh, to understand. This is where the surgeon will come in and resect and remove the majority of the, the stomach. This area right here um, that's kind of moon shaped, that is removed and actually removed from the patient. And um, this leaves a much smaller gastric pouch or gastric sleeve, and, excuse me. And it's about the size of a banana. And so basically that will limit your portion size um, and will limit all of the um, function of this part of the stomach that is going to be um, removed and discarded. In the gastric bypass, it's uh, slightly more involved. Uh, there's more anatomic uh, rearranging, if you will. So the surgeon will uh, fashion a pouch from the top part of the stomach, and this is called the new gastric pouch. Uh, this is the esophagus coming down here, will remain attached to the top part of the stomach. Um, but this larger area of the stomach and the upper part of the small intestine will all be bypassed and 
lower down in the small intestine will be brought up and joined to this new pouch. So you can follow the route of food that you eat with this red arrow. You will eat food, it will be stored in the pouch, which will be quickly emptied straight back into the small intestine, just a lot lower than it normally was. The other big difference with the gastric bypass is this large portion of the stomach that was removed remains intact in the patient. It's just reattached down here later in the same limb of the small intestine. And so you still get deposition of the gastric juice um, the gut hormones, the bile, um, pancreatic enzymes, everything that happens in this part of the um, duodenum still happens. It just happens in the absence of food and, um, and absence of absorption of that food until it rejoins in the jejunum, um, the food that has come from the pouch. So why is surgical treatment so effective? Well, we used to think that it was strictly mechanical. You make the stomach smaller, you eat less food, restrict the food intake, and you don't absorb um, the food. But in fact, that's not, um, that's not the whole story. So the current model is that this is a lot more complex than just limiting the amount of food and absorption that we have. Um, we know now that the GI signals that are involved from our, our stomach, our GI system, and the brain involve both our neuronal system, our nerves, and the endocrine system, which um, the signaling pathways are uh, accomplished by hormones in our body. These altered GI signals go to other organs in our body, such as the pancreas, the liver, and um, change how our metabolism is actually affected. So it's not as simple as the size of the stomach is smaller. So this GI regulation of metabolic function um, can get quite complex. So we're going to try to uh, simplify and just kind of look at the two major players. So when we look at our metabolism, we'll simplify this to the fasting state or when we're hungry and the fed state or what is called the postprandial phase. So we'll look at the fasting state first. And the main player here is a hormone called ghrelin. We can think about ghrelin as the bad guy, if you will. We uh, don't like ghrelin. Ghrelin makes us hungry. It increases our appetite, increases our energy intake because we're hungry and we eat. Um, it increases gastric emptying and that just kind of feeds the whole process. So, so ghrelin is not great. A um, few other things that ghrelin does, it um, goes to the liver and increases um, the amount of sugar that our liver is actually making, that's a job that our liver has, but um, it gets dysregulated and, and starts making too much. It also starts to store fat in the liver. That's where fatty liver disease can come from. Um, it makes our stomach get ready for the food that we're putting in it and secrete more acid. Um, so that over overproduction of that can become a problem. It goes to the pancreas to decrease insulin sensitivity. And depending on how much you know about diabetes, you know that that's, that's a problem that leads to diabetes. Um, our insulin doesn't work as well anymore and our um, sugar metabolism changes. It also goes to our fat mass and um, decreases something called thermogenesis or burning of fat energy. And it tells the cells to get bigger and, and increases fat mass. So again, ghrelin is not something that we um, want uh, overexpressed. Interestingly enough, patients with obesity have incredibly high levels of ghrelin. So they truly are, in fact, hungry and they're, they're making a hormone through no, no um, effort of their own at all that is causing all of these things to happen. Now let's look at the fed state or the postprandial phase. The major player here is a hormone called GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide-1. Um, that is located predominantly in the distal or end part of the small intestine. It is um, increased by the presence of food. So hence this naturally increases um, after we have eaten. Um, once the level starts to rise, you see that um, it goes to the pancreas and helps our insulin work better, um, feeds back up 
um, to the brain and says, hey, we've eaten, we're not hungry anymore. So it suppresses everything that ghrelin does um, in its end organs. Looking at um, the other things that GLP-1 does, it goes to the liver. We said it decreases sugar production. Remember, it also um, decreases everything ghrelin does, so it decreases fatty liver um, and fatty uh, de deposition into the liver. You feel fuller longer because the gastric emptying slows down. Um, in the heart, it's really important um, because it increases contractility, cardiac output, um, left ventricular function. This is um, a big part of why some diabetic medicines are actually cardioprotective, um, if you have heard that before. Then GLP-1 goes out to the muscles and increases that insulin sensitivity. So it helps us take up sugar better and use our sugar better and use our insulin better so that we're not burning up our pancreas. Um, insulin comes from the pancreas. Uh, another thing that GLP-1 does is it goes to those beta cells in our pancreas and helps them live longer. Um, when you have diabetes and you are, are not very sensitive to insulin, those beta cells are having to produce more and more um, and they burn out. And once they do in a large number, that's when you develop uh, insulin um, dependent diabetes and have to take injections. So we don't want that. So what does all this mean? Well, surgery changes all of this. It changes the regulation of all of this. Um, looking here, you can see that um, the gut brain uh, signals are all different. And this is encompassing both um, types of surgery that we talked about before, the bypass and the sleeve. And we'll talk a minute about which one um, causes which, but you can see the sleeve here. And we see that the ghrelin production can be the same, um, more or less. And in, and in fact, it's less, um, especially with the uh, gastric sleeve. We have um, GLP-1 we talked about going up. All of these are hormones that very much like GLP-1 have what's called an incretin effect. They increase um, insulin sensitivity and decrease our resistance to our insulin. Um, we have um, our appetite regulation is changed and we're fuller, longer, faster with either of the surgeries that you have done. So comparing, this is the slide that I was referencing, the um, gastric bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy. You can see that um, predominantly uh, the nutrient handling, um, the changes are more on, um, more on the, the bypass side. Um, when we talk about the uh, pancreatic hormones and specifically ghrelin and GLP-1 that we talked about before, you see that there's a bigger suppression of ghrelin um, in the uh, patients who have a gastric sleeve. And the GLP-1, which was the major player in um, changing the meta metabolism, happens actually with the Roux and Y gastric bypass. So you can tell that this is in fact, why you get much more weight loss with a bypass than a sleeve gastrectomy on, on, on average on the whole. And so when we talked about the classic um, model and why it was not solely restrictive dieting, all of what we just talked about in those slides um, explains why a gastric bypass is actually the opposite of restrictive eating. Um, your energy expenditure goes up because you're burning fat. Um, your appetite actually goes down. You're not hungry. If anybody has ever been on a diet, you know that you're hungry. Um, you, you're not satiated. Um, the reward-based um, eating behaviors go up. Um, all of that is the opposite when you have a bypass. You're not hungry, you're fuller longer, um, and the reward systems um, in the brain from eating are, are decreased. Um, and then we have talked about the effects of ghrelin and GLP-1. So metabolic surgery mechanisms and review, decreased appetite. Um, it's interesting that um, specifically your, your taste buds kind of change and you have altered food preferences. You don't want sweets and fats as much um, usually in these patients. 
um, their ability to burn fat goes up, and that has to do with the thermoregulation that we talked about with the hormones. Um, we also are going to talk in depth about this in a minute. Um, there is weight independent improvement in diabetes. That means that there can be remission of your diabetes, even outside of just the amount of weight that you lose. We see this because patients who have the bypass and um, in fact can go home before they even really lost weight from the hospital with less insulin need or sometimes not even need their insulin um, just from the action of surgery in itself. The other large thing about the metabolic mechanisms of surgery is this thing called altered fat mass set point. So all of us have a point where our metabolism is set to accept this much fat mass. This is the weight that our body is programmed to say, okay, this is where I want to be. When we simply diet, even with certain medications, we are chasing that set point, but we can't change it. We can't change. This is where our body is going to accept. So that's kind of the advent of the yo-yo diet. You, you gain it, you lose it, you gain it, you lose it. Um, and with surgery, while it may not reset you to a perfect BMI, it actually resets your set point to lower. And that is the uh, metabolic set point that your body is going to be chasing. Um, for some patients, that's, that's a deal breaker if that can't happen um, because they've tried everything else and it hasn't worked. So this all begs the question of when do we consider bariatric surgery? Um, well, there are inclusion criteria specifically based on BMI. Um, if you have a BMI of 40 or higher with or without uh, comorbidities, then um, speaking to these criteria, you qualify for bariatric surgery. Um, if you have more than two uh, comorbid conditions that would improve with weight loss, so think reflux, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, um, then if you have a BMI of 35 or higher, then you could be a bariatric surgical candidate. The uh, patient would need to be in an acceptable operative risk. So that means that you're, you should be healthy enough to be able to um, survive being put under from an anesthesia standpoint. Um, this comes into play with our risk stratification. This would be something that um, you can work with your primary care doctor with, your, your um, specialist, your heart doctor, your cardiologist um, to optimize your, your risk before surgery. And the patient needs to be able to participate in treatment and long-term follow-up. Bariatric surgery is a lifestyle change, so it's not a quick fix. None of, none of the options that we've talked about are a quick fix. Um, the patient needs to be able to participate in all of the nutrition changes, the lifestyle changes, um, and then very importantly, the follow-up to make sure that they're healing appropriately. And then an understanding of um, what they're having done, what they're candidate for, and what about their life is going to need to change in order to make this successful. Some other reasons that patients consider bariatric surgery, um, I thought were put very, very eloquently and, and just real in these two quotes that I found. Um, I'll read the second one. Obese individuals would rather have a normal weight with severe disability, such as be deaf, have heart disease, have an amputation, and others rather than to be obese without any of these conditions. I think that really just speaks to how, how complex this disease is and how much it affects people, if even some people feel that way about having obesity. Additional um, reasons to consider gastric bypass surgery um, that we don't always think of, um, reflux. That is a very significant reason to consider bariatric surgery. Um, ruin why gastric bypass is actually the most effective bariatric procedure um, leading to weight reduction and improvement in reflux symptoms in bariatric or obese patients. Um, the Bypass is actually the procedure of choice if uh, a patient has obesity and has either failed the um, fund application or the uh, older, if you will, uh, gold standard treatment for reflux, or if they, for some reason, can't take 
uh, antacids for the rest of their life. Um, if they've had reflux for a long time, they may have esophageal changes that down the road could put them at risk for things like esophageal cancer. That's called Barrett's esophagus. Um, they could be a gastric bypass uh, um, candidate. And then um, last but not least, gastroparesis. That's a condition that actually a lot of diabetics get, but you don't have to have diabetes to have it. Um, that's where the stomach muscles and um, the muscles of the uh, small intestine are paralyzed and they don't flow and don't move. It can be in incredibly um, uncomfortable. It can lead to other problems and uh, decreased quality of life for these patients. And there are lots of surgical options. Um, there are lots of medical options. Unfortunately, most of them are not very successful, um, but the gastric bypass um, helps to, to fix that. Um, there are uh, undeniable psychosocial um, and um, psychological improvements um, that can happen with uh, bariatric surgery. Um, these are increase of quality of life. We talked about maybe being able to get a new job, um, enjoy social gatherings, um, have better mood and self-esteem. And especially if you suffer from a lot of comorbidities that um, might have you taking a lot of time off from work or maybe not even be able to work, um, treating that obesity and, and getting to a lower BMI may make you be able to uh, work more. Um, and so that's very significant. So the biggest thing that I would like to talk about now is, um, is diabetes, because I don't think that we uh, really consider bariatric surgery as a treatment option enough for our diabetics. So um, these are going to be some studies that really help us see and understand why if you have um, diabetes that is not controlled, especially if you have a high BMI, um, that bariatric surgery should, should at least cross our minds as an option uh, for, for treatment for these patients. It's the only thing that we have, including medicine, that can put um, diabetes in remission. So um, there was an article in 1995 um, that was published that was called Who Would Have Thought It? And the take home message was that it showed bariatric surgery patients um, to be to have the, the most improvement and, and that bariatric surgery was most effective in forms of treatment for diabetes. Um, it decreased mortality from uh, almost 9% to less than 2% when they compared these patients. And over 83% of the patients involved in the study had improvement in their uh, non-insulin dependent diabetes. And, and that can not be said about any medication that we can prescribe you. So coming into the 21st century, about 20 years later, um, we finally got uh, agreement among many of the um, international organizations and the uh, American Association of uh, Diabetes or the Diabetes Association released a statement that's um, affected many policies and insurance um, coverage, et cetera. Um, there is sufficient evidence sufficient clinical and mechanistic evidence to support the inclusion of metabolic surgery among anti-diabetes interventions for people with type two diabetes and obesity. And so that was really important in um, such esteemed uh, organizations actually admitting that bariatric surgery could treat uh, diabetes. Most of the additional um, studies that we'll talk about came from um, a Swedish study um, that was called uh, Swedish Obesity um, uh, Subjects. And there's just abundant literature on this to support these findings. Um, this first study here that was uh, written took about 4,000 patients and about half of them had bariatric surgery. The other half had um, just conventional treatment, diet, exercise, um, and medication. And what they found was that only 129 deaths occurred in the control group, but much less than that in the surgery group with 101. The two main types of uh, causes of death were heart attack and cancer. And specifically, heart attack was 50% less likely and cancer 30% less likely if those patients with diabetes had surgery. 
Um, so that was the conclusion of that study was that surgery was associated with not only long-term weight loss, but decreased mortality. It's literally life-saving. Um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, also from the Swedish study, um, they compiled a paper for uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease and followed those patients for two to 10 years. And they showed that the surgical group had sustained weight loss up to 16% after 10 years, um, but not just that, specifically that there was improvement in the comorbidities. So this was the big um, discovery here was that the surgery actually improved their diabetes and their um, high triglycerides and bad cholesterol and their blood pressure and even gout. Um, and that not only was surgery better, but specifically the gastric bypass was um, superior to both the sleeve and something we haven't talked much about, but um, the gastric band um, as far as reducing these risk factors. There was a diabetic prevention study that was um, pretty uh, striking that showed a 15 year follow up of about 16 100 surgical patients and 1,700 um, controls. Nobody had diabetes at baseline in these studies. And it showed about four times uh, more development in diabetes with the control patients than surgery patients. So that's you're four times more likely to develop diabetes if you started this study um, and no one had diabetes. Uh, than the patients who had weight loss surgery. So what is the take home message of all those studies? Um, surgery is a viable treatment option for patients with obesity and uncontrolled diabetes. Um, we can make their, them have the potential to live longer, um, control not just the diabetes, but other things, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. That means that you may not have to be on as much medication or at least a lower dose of medication. May mean that you're admitted to the hospital less, may mean that you have to go to the doctor less, um, that you can live a, a better life. Um, and all of this is evidence that bariatric surgery is really metabolic surgery, not just weight loss surgery. Um, earlier intervention um, also leads to a better chance of total remission of your uh, diabetes. So one of the last things I want to talk about is, is safety. I get that uh, question from patients a lot. Well, isn't, isn't that too risky? Do you really think I need that? Or I don't think that it's safe enough. And, and so there was a perioperative safety study um, called LABS for short. We'll talk about just the first two, LABS 1 and 2. And LABS 1 talked about the 30-day safety profile. Um, they took about 4,000 patients. Uh, 3,000 had surgery and 1,000 had gastric band. Um, and they showed that at about 30 days, there was a 0.3% uh, mortality in those patients. Um, that's really low. So that means that that's a very safe procedure. And I thought that it is pertinent just to compare here. This was outside of the study, but at a bariatric metabolic center of excellence, um, the rate for uh, the 30 day mortality is required to be lower and is in fact 0.13. So that, that's less than half actually of even 0.3. And um, we're really lucky again that we have a center of excellence here within our system. Um, 4.3 had a major adverse outcome. And the big thing that this found was it's, it's not all comers that have these risks. There was a significant um, increase in, in risk if you had one of these um, previous uh, risk factors. So if you'd had a clot before, if you already had sleep apnea, if you had a BMI of higher than 53, or if you couldn't um, self-ambulate, move around more. So this helps make this an even safer procedure because we can screen for these things and we can work on optimizing these things before the actual procedure. The um, three-year wait uh, and health follow-up was uh, LABS-2, and it took about 2,000 patients, and all but 600 of them had the gastric bypass. The rest had an adjustable band. Um, there was much more weight loss, as we can see here, um, over double the amount of weight loss for the gastric bypass patients. Um, but the big finding here was that it's much safer than the band in terms of 
needing to have a reoperation. Um, of those 6,000, excuse me, of those 2,000 um, bypass patients, only four had to have either a revision or a reversal surgery within those three years. Um, but the band, there were 77 out of 600, so that's, that's a much higher incidence um, that had to have it repositioned or removed or replaced. Um, so that was the big thing there. The other big thing was that um, they found significant improvement across the board in everybody with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, much like we, we've seen in these previous studies, but um, much better response almost three times better response from gastric bypass than with bands. Um, and you can see those numbers there. So other long-term um, studies, we'll just do one of each, the laparoscopic sleeve. Um, they looked at 195 patients, um, most of which had type two diabetes and they looked at them over seven years and it showed uh, about a 10% decrease in um, their uh, hypertension and dyslipidemia, and about half had complete remission of their diabetes. When we compared that to a 10 to 13 year study that showed gastric bypass uh, patients, they had much better weight loss. They had on the order of 60% um, of their excess weight loss, but they also had, look at these numbers, 58% um, resolution of their diabetes, almost 50% of hypertension and hyperlipidemia was resolved with the gastric bypass. And then we'd be remiss if we didn't at least mention the stampede studies um, when we're talking about comorbidities and diabetes. Um, this study showed 137 patients and they split them about half and half, medical therapy plus surgery and then intensive medical therapy. 91 patients showed up for follow-up three years later, and this showed a primary endpoint of the max control diabetes. We're usually happy if we get your A1C under seven um, and a half or seven, but they required an A1C of less than six. And you can see almost none of the patients in the medical group had attained this, but about 40% in bypass and 24% in sleeve. So that was pretty significant. Um, risk reduction um, and control of their diabetes that was shown there. So in summary, um, I think we've, we've expressed why bariatric surgery really is more adequately named metabolic surgery. Um, metabolic surgery has more indications than just weight loss. Um, we uh, talked about Barrett's esophagus, reflux, gastroparesis, and then of course diabetes. Um, and it can prolong patients' lives and improve comorbidities. Um, and then good news is it's much safer than it's been in the past, especially at a center of excellence like we have here within our system. Um, I've included some patient resources on the last screen, um, and these will be available um, for some websites for more information and more information about our program um, to um, learn more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Powell, for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, I think it was very helpful for us to hear from a medical doctor's perspective of, of when uh, metabolic and bariatric surgery might be useful and um, what your thoughts are on that. So that's very helpful. I did want to share uh, with those of you on the call that we have several obesity medicine specialists available um, here in our program, as you, as you see on the screen. So um, if somebody's interested in medical weight loss, this is a great place to start if you've never tried it. And then as she said, you know, their goal is for their patients to lose about five to 10% of their excess weight. But when more is needed, that's where um, bariatric surgery can be very helpful. Um, we have three very talented uh, bariatric surgeons here at Northeast Georgia Medical Center. Uh, we are a center of excellence, as she mentioned. We have been since 2006. A center of excellence um, brings with it some known very good outcomes. We have to uh, report our outcomes every month to a national database. And those outcomes are very closely monitored. It also means that when you go to a center of excellence that you encounter staff at the hospital that have additional education. They specialize in taking care of these patients. And our patients just don't go anywhere in the hospital where a bed is free. They actually have to go to a specific bariatric unit. Um, and again, uh, mortality and outcomes uh, are both much better at uh, going to a center of excellence where, where we have a very comprehensive um, center. 
Um, we do have a wonderful aftercare program. So if you're not aware, even if somebody does choose medical weight loss, for example, they have lots of services available to them afterwards. Um, we, we have therapists uh, in our program that can do counseling. We have a dietitian that can work alongside you with a medical weight loss doctor. We have yoga and weightlifting that's free to our patients, uh, cooking classes once a month to teach patients how to eat uh, in a, a healthy way that's going to support their weight loss journey. Uh, we have a clothing closet that you see pictured here where patients can come and uh, shop out of gently used clothes. And then for those who do have uh, weight loss surgery with us, we do have weekly support groups that they can attend either in person or virtually. Uh, and then we also have some virtual support through a closed Facebook group uh, for those patients. So how to get started, we do have a website, it's nghs.com backslash bariatric. This is where if someone's interested, the first step would be honestly to watch our free online seminar that goes really into detail um, about these surgeries and the lifestyle changes necessary to make it uh, a, a lifetime uh, you know, uh, tool for you. We have our phone number here. Uh, we're at 770-219-0446. You can call us if you have questions. Uh, we do have an email where you can submit questions and we can follow up with you afterwards as well at bariatric underscore support at NGHS.com. So thank you so much for tuning in today. We appreciate it.